New Grub Street is a novel by George Gissing, published in 1891, which is set in the literary and journalistic circles of 1880s London. The story deals with the literary world that Gissing himself had experienced. Its title refers to the London street Grub Street, which in the 18th century became synonymous with hack literature. By Gissing's time, Grub Street itself no longer existed, though hack writing certainly did. Its two central characters are a sharply contrasted pair of writers. Edwin Reardon, a novelist of some talent with limited commercial prospects, and Jasper Moven, a young journalist, hardworking and capable of generosity, but cynical and only semi-scrupulous about writing and its purpose in a modern world. Thank you for tuning in to the Global Novel. I'm Claire Hennessy. With me today to discuss this wonderful novel are doctors Katie Mullen, Tom Wu, and Richard Mankey. Dr. Mullen is professor of modern literature and culture at University of Leeds. Her research explores connections between late Victorian and modernist fiction. She's the author of James Joyce's *Sexuality and Social Purity* and another book titled *Working Girls: Fiction, Sexuality, and Maternity*. Dr. Wu is assistant professor in English of the long 19th century at Cape Breton University and advising editor of the Complete Letters of Henry James at University of Nebraska Press. He is the author of Sherlock Holmes and Shakespeare. He also writes extensively on George Gissing and Harry Redcroft. Dr. Mankey is an associate professor of English at the University of Georgia. He is the author of *Telegraphic Realism: Victorian Fiction and Other Information Systems*, and another book titled *Literature, Print Culture, and Media Technologies from 1880 to 1900: Many Inventions*. Welcome to the show, everybody. And, and Katie, could you begin with how the protagonist Reardon's struggle between artistic integrity and commercial success reflects those those broader social tensions around creativity and financial stability during the Victorian era? Oh, thank you very much, Claire. Thank you for your lovely introduction, and thank you, thank you for inviting me to take part in this podcast on New Grub Street, which is one of my very favourite novels.、Um, so, if we're thinking about how the novel、um, kind of foregrounds and engages with contemporary issues around the balance between、um, artistic integrity and commercial success, we kind of have to locate it in its time.、Um, although it's written in, it's published in 1891, as you mentioned in your introduction, it's Set in the 1880s, around the early 1880s, when debates about the form and、um, the politics and the kind of the, the, the limits of the, of the Victorian novel were very much current and being hotly debated in the literary periodicals of the day.、Um, much of those debates revolved around the novel's form. Um, because um, Victorian writers were constrained、um, and had been constrained for about forty or fifty years before the publication of New Grub Street to write in three volumes for the circulating libraries.、Um, so, how the book, Victorian book market worked was、um, a novel would be published in, in three volumes, priced at thirty-one shillings and sixpence, which is way beyond、um, the pockets of any. Even middle class readers couldn't afford that kind of outlay on, a, on an individual mod- novel, so they used to subscribe to circulating libraries. The most famous one is Mudie's, who would lend out the books for the guinea subscription, the great guinea annual subscription that was required. If a book was sufficiently popular under this system, it would later on be published in cheaper forms、um, for mass sale. And also, if a book was particularly or a novelist was particularly successful, they might be able to sell serial rights to the novel、um, in. One of the many fiction magazines that were around at the time, so Dickens, Trollope, George Eliot, all serialised、uh, their novels.、Um, and Hardy did it. Hardy was always selling his novels several times over, once in serial version and then in the novel form, and then later on as a cheaper edition. But for writers like Gissing, who did not have that kind of popular appeal,、um, they were increasingly kind of constrained by this、um, this mode of. Mode of publication,、um, particularly because it was customary to sell the copyright to anything they wrote. So you'd sell the copyright,、um, off it would go. The publisher would publish it in this three-volume form. If it wasn't a massive smash hit, that's the last you'd you'd see of any any money. So there's. 
what what happens around around in the 1880s is that writers get increasingly agitated about the commercial inhibitions and the way that they can't really earn money from writing unless they're going to write bestsellers and also the the inhibitions around their creative practice uh, because there's a strong impetus to write fiction that would sell and fiction that catered to the popular taste so the big question coming out of the 1880s was what happens to writers of serious literary purpose, writers like Gissing himself, like George Moore, Henry James. Um, what do these writers do and how do they frame themselves in this climate? Um, Tom, I don't know if you want to, do you want to come in here? I um, don't want to kind of hog the whole. Oh, sure. Um, I could talk a bit about this, this issue of novelistic form, which, which Katie has talked about so, has introduced so well. And I think that it's, that speaks to one of Gissing's innovations here, because he's so very much aware of the form of the novel. And in a very, very early scene, he tells his sisters, Maud and, and Dora, that, you know, why don't you, well, he asks them, well, why, why don't you write these Sunday um, these these Sunday school prize books, and he's and they were like, well, why would we want it? Why, why, why would we want to do this? And he's like, well, okay, you know, you can learn how to do this, and you can just read like a half dozen of of these specimens, study them, learn about how they work, and try to replicate this. Now, of course, to for most of us, we're like, hey. So you, you don't actually care about what you're doing. You're just trying to, to replicate. But now Gissing is, does more here. And I think we do well to put some pressure on, 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 you know, on, on his text. Because even though, you know, Dawa and Maud may be replicating a form of, of, of the Sunday prize book, it doesn't mean that they just have to import that form. They can also do things with it. And I think, Gissing's own novel does that with his free volume structure. He's very self-conscious about the fact that the free volume novel is on its way out. But he does a free volume novel here. He's so very self-conscious about the fact that people are using conversation to fill up the pages of a novel. But here we are. We have pages and pages of conversation about things that are not necessarily very relevant to the story. But he moves us along by means of that. And I think that's one of his many achievements here. But as Case points out, you know, there's this irony that that's in this novel where, you know, he's telling us, okay, you know, this, this thing is on, the free volume novel is on its way out. But here is a free volume novel that's quite, that reads very well, that holds together too. But there's also this thing about the slipperiness of his position. Where does he stand in this? So he's pointing to the fact that this thing is on his way out, but at the same time, he's still doing it. And that's kind of what happens with our, with one of our main characters, Jasper Milvane. And I'll look forward to hearing Katie's thoughts about that, about this character whom we are supposed to despise. But then at the same time, we don't, at least I don't really. <laughs> I know my friend Richard equates me to Melvin, so maybe that has something to do with it. Right. Richard, could you briefly walk us through the historical background of the printing and writing as a developing industry that, that underlies the major plot line of the novel? Yes, sure. Of course. Thank you, Claire. Well, I think we sometimes uh, think about uh, print culture as just uh, one thing, especially in the 21st century when we might worry that we're at the end of print culture, or it's being transformed radically. Um, but uh, it really undergoes a lot of changes uh, from, from Gutenberg to the 20th century. Uh, and a lot of the biggest changes happen in the 19th century. So um, the the 19th century uh, brings uh really the kind of the application of new kinds of techniques to uh, to printing in particular. Um, of all the, the media revolutions of the century, we could think of the, the, the telephone and the electric telegraph and the phonograph and uh, the typewriter and even uh, radio and motion pictures at the end of the century, a lot of the revolutionary technologies are actually uh, concerned print. So we have uh, the rotary uh, uh, press, the kind of presses you see in old Hollywood movies when they say, stop the presses. Um, and we have the application of uh, steam and later electricity uh, to printing. So it really ramps up the, the speed of printing. It turns printing from a kind of artisanal industry 
um, into sort of a, a true kind of modern sort of like factory. And so uh, New Grub Street is a story about, about writers, um, a story about intellectuals. Um, but the whole framework um, for the novel uh, concerns these uh, these wholesale changes to the the business of writing that are becoming very clear by the end of the century when Gissing is writing. Well, Tom, what are other Gissing's major experiments with novelistic form, and how our reading is shaped by new developments in the novel? I feel like now I'm going to launch into a defense of Milbane, <laughs> and maybe uh, and maybe Richard is right. Maybe there is something of him in me, but hopefully. You know the 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 better bits, the energy, the energy. Because I think we can all appreciate the energy in in Milvane. It's a bit like Becky Sharp and Amelia, isn't it? From from Vanity Fair, where you know we are driven by Becky's narrative, and with Amelia, we just you know we just you know flip the pages and you know get the story moving, and that's that's kind of how it is with Milvane. Now, I follow the the late critic Robert Selleck in 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 argue well. Robert Selleck argues that the thing here is that with Biffin and Reardon, we tend to associate these writers with with literary value and, and artistic integrity, but neither of them is a particularly good writer. They only demonstrate promise in the case of Reardon, and in the case of Biffin, he's only doing his own thing. So neither of them is really all that great. Of a writer, I just want to point that out. Now, in terms of Melvane, he's very well aware of his limitations. He knows that he is a not a novelist, and it, there are suggestions that he has tried writing a novel, and Gissing himself has tried writing plays. Now. He has tried, but he is not successful in that arena. So he's now turning to journalism, and that works for him. Now, one of the most often quoted lines in in、um, New Grub Street is that is from Melvin. If only I had the skill, I would produce novels out trashing the trashiest that ever sold fifty thousand copies. So if he could, he would do this, right? But the bit that isn't really quoted very much is the sentence before: "Let us use our wits to earn money and make the best we can of our lives." Let us use our wits to earn money and make the best we can of our lives. I think that sums up a very different aspect of Milvain. He's trying to survive in the ways that he can in this climate that. Is not very hospitable. It's extremely commercial, and you know he has some talent in journalism in this kind of writing. He's doing his best. He knows his limitations. He's doing his best. He's trying to survive. I think that we should we would do well to to think about this aspect of this character who is very frank about his agenda. He has very few pretensions. He doesn't have. A whole lot of ambitions, even though he is ambitious. But you know, he's doing his best. Right, I agree. Well, the character moment certainly represents a paradigm of literary success fueled by commercial tactics, contrasting with with、uh, Reardon's artistic ideals. So, so Tom, where do we find the narrator's voice stand between the、uh, artistic pursuit of of literature and and the commercial demands of the、uh, of the publishing industry? And how does Um, the narrative balance both aspects, and, and what lesson or, or commentary does it offer about the、uh, intersection of art and commerce during that era? This is such a great question. And in terms of the literary landscape, Gissing is responding in some ways to this really important novel by Walter Besant, who became the、um, president of the Society of Author, and who is really. Everywhere in the literary scene in the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, and so and so forth. So Gissing is responding to this novel called All in a Garden Fair, which came about in eighteen eighty three. And in that novel, Walter Besant talks about how there are fourteen thousand people who are living by literature in London alone at that time. Fourteen thousand people. Now. 
if we are to look at the statistics that that are given by the Office Licensing and Collection Society, the AL, the ALCS, which um, a lot of us are registered with, in、um, a lot of writers are registered with. So, if we look at the statistics from last year, the median of income of of our offer earnings has dropped to seven thousand pounds in a year, like for a whole year. That's an annual income of seven thousand pounds, and in two thousand six, it was twelve thousand three hundred thirty. So seven thousand pounds is not enough to live on, but it also represented a sixty percent drop. Once you adjust inflation, significant drops in offer incomes, and we also would want to factor in the fact that even in this number, in the seven thousand pounds, this average income of writers, you're putting in some really heavy earners. Like if you're thinking about this average, it includes some very heavy earners. The top ten percent of offers earn about forty-seven percent of all offer incomes, so the picture is incredibly bleak, right? We are talking about a, a system and a profession that isn't very sustainable. So I think that in this climate, New Grub Street offers a very compelling picture of what of of The commercial and well, the material concerns that writers face, as well as how that that informs our day to day lives. I think that most of us are are、um, are writing on the side as opposed to as opposed to you know writing full time. Very very few writers are working full time. So according to the statistics, again, this is last year. The proportion of authors earning all their income from writing has decreased. From forty percent in two thousand six to nineteen percent, and this is we're talking about the the population registered with the AALCS, and that isn't everybody. So very few writers are are only writing. Guessing is describing a, a group of people who are still trying to keep things going, and I think now in this climate we are we are looking at we are coming from a place where we just know that we can. Just be writing professionally anymore, or we can survive as as professional writers. That's right. Well, Richard, your essay titled "New Grub Street's Ecology of Paper" really offers a、uh, very interesting perspective of reading the plot by accentuating the、uh, backdrop of. Uh, the development of papermaking industry at the time, and what's so fascinating about it is that it it draws. Our attention to the resource ecologies, right, and and even the natural histories of the late nineteenth century authorship, media, and print capitalism by large. Could you elaborate more on how the background of the material culture, and especially the、uh, development of the paper industry, undergird the、uh, major plot lines of the novel? Sure, Claire. Well, I, I think that when we think about、um, uh, ecology and literature, we might think about. Um, nature writing, and there's hardly any nature in New Grub Street. It's a predominantly urban novel about all these、uh, intellectuals and their struggles,、uh, living in、uh, in a kind of very modern seeming London.、Um, but、uh, I was interested in the ways in which the、uh, radical transformations in the paper industry, part of these transformations of print culture,、um, are、um, in the background of the novel. But、uh, but like. But but really there.、Um, so、uh, as far as the history,、um, uh, basically、uh, European paper for hundreds of years is made from old underwear.、Uh, it's made from a cotton and, and linen rags,、um, and so the、uh, the the rag and bone man、uh, is, is going around collecting rags to be、uh, made into a pulp for for paper. Um, but this is a, a very kind of、uh, laborious process, and you need a lot of rags to produce papers. And so, as the uh, uh, 
industry of uh, of print uh, explodes as you have phenomena like a, a growing mass literacy, uh, more leisure, even things like um, commutes during which people could read and wanted were bored and wanted to read um, printed materials. Um, you really kind of um, uh, hit a kind of um, a, a choke point for the production of, of paper. Um, and so uh, uh, there are all of these. If you like this episode so far and want to complete the entire episode, you can subscribe at theglobalnovel.com slash subscribe. Thank you so much for listening.